The president wants to spy on 200 million Americans without a warrant. Has he read this document, which he was sworn to uphold? Now, I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. When we do have secret prisons, that is not what America's all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Good evening, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. The United States had a spate of terrorist attacks uh, just last week. Well, terrorist attacks and mass killings, shall we say. There were three. Most of the attention went to the Boston terrorist attack, the one that occurred at the Boston Marathon. And of course, there's a lot of interesting questions about that. Not only what served to radicalize the, the young immigrant family, including a naturalized American and a, a permanent resident immigrant, those young men, but also police procedure, legal procedures, and what we can do to prevent terrorist attacks in the future. I understand why the press put a lot of focus on Boston. What I don't understand is why there wasn't more attention made to an explosion at a factory in a small town called West in Texas, where a plant had stored 54,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate, which is used for fertilizer, but is also highly explosive, storing much greater quantities of this explosive than were used to rip apart the Oklahoma City Federal Building by Tim McVeigh in a terrorist attack in the 1990s. What procedures were followed or should have been followed to keep that attack from happening, to keep that explosion from happening? And why wasn't more media attention devoted to it? And also, there's almost no media attention, a little bit, to ricin attacks. Now, when we had anthrax attacks a few months after September 11th, that was big news. But when a person sends a letter to the President of the United States, to a sitting senator, and to a local judge, all laced with ricin, which of course is a biological agent that has no known antidote and would have killed had any of those three people been in contact with it, it gets very little news. I want to talk about why that is. We got a lot to talk about. I want to move on and talk about the FAA and sequester and the new bill that serves to put people back on the job at the FAA, air traffic controllers, but takes away from the airport improvement fund. I want to talk about whether Syria has crossed a red line with chemical weapons. And finally, end with a note on Jason Collins, the first player in professional sports. Uh, he, of course, is in the National Basketball Association to come out as gay. So we have a lot on our agenda, Mike. Um, my guest, of course, is Mike Lane. He is a Republican strategist, the president of Intelligence Strategies. Mike, thanks again for coming here on the Inside Scoop. Glad to be here, Mark. Let me start with just the three attacks. And you may think it's not appropriate to put Texas in with the other two. I do, because it seems to me that while uh, the ricin attack and the Boston Marathon attack were certainly intentional acts where people are, are trying to kill and maim uh, you know, innocent people, uh, what happened in West Texas uh, is almost to me just as sinister. Here you have a company that did not follow the regulations necessary to uh, protect us from this incredible explosive, an explosive of far more power, frankly, than anything the Boston bombers did or anything the ricin guy did. Uh, at least 15 people are dead. We don't even know how many are dead. Houses were destroyed in a, in a half mile radius. They found some of the debris two miles away. And you know this small town, uh, the, the, even the first responders apparently weren't warned that after the first fire, if they come in to try to help, which they did, there might be a later explosion because of the ammonia nitrate. Uh, about four were involved in the original fire, so we know, but at least 10, probably more, were people who rushed in to try to help. So my first question for you is, uh, should this have gotten at least, well, more attention than it did, uh, at least, say, half as much as the Boston bomber attention in the media? And well, let's just start there. Let's just start about the media attention. Well, it, it should have, yes, Mark. But remember, the media is trying to sell soap in the uh, vernacular. And a terrorist attack is a lot sexier sell than uh, an industrial accident in West Texas. Uh, and also the, the, Boston is the, a media yeah, center, yeah. And, and West Texas no one ever heard of the, prior to this attack. The, no one outside the, the, the media blew it, but it's predictable they would blow it. OK. Well, I would hope that, at least in the public debate, we would talk about Texas at least as much as the admittedly sexier story going on in Boston. Because it seems to me that industrial accidents are, frankly, a lot more common than terrorist attacks. And that's why we need regulation to prevent these kinds of things from happening. And ammonium nitrate is a particularly powerful explosive. There was also anhydrous ammonia in there, a gas 
that can explode. Uh, after all, the bomb was strong enough, I, I call it a bomb, an explosion, was strong enough to set off an earthquake. Uh, there was a school and a nursing home nearby. They found debris as far as two miles away. This was a very powerful explosion. And as I, as I mentioned, it was more powerful than the exact same weapon, ammonium nitrate, used against Oklahoma City mm -hmm. uh, Center. Uh, it, interestingly, there was a story done where they interviewed the Texas Secretary of State. He said there's 115 of these places across Texas, and he knows where they are, but he's not allowed to inform the public. Uh, apparently, there is a, a Texas law that says that these places are allowed to store ex highly explosive material, and he, it is illegal under Texas law to inform the public. Uh, let me start by saying that I think if you are required to inform the public of a child molester next door, you should also be required to inform the public of highly explosive material next door. Well. Mark, it shouldn't be highly explosive material the way it's stored. Uh, you started off the segment exactly right, is that they stored it apparently in violation of regulations as to how this stuff ought to be uh, taken care of. Now, there's absolutely no excuse for that. There ought to be accountability for that and the damage that they caused and the deaths that they caused. Uh, but if they, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm assuming that if they stored it uh, in compliance with the existing regulations, that would have made it a safe uh, situation. Well, let me be more specific here. The regulations that we know, we don't know whether or not the canisters, or so to speak, were stored, maybe they were stored properly in the canisters. I don't know that. That hasn't been proven. The only thing that we know from investigation so far is that they didn't report to the Department of Homeland Security. Department of Homeland Security is supposed to be, uh, you're supposed to give notice to, when you ever have more than 400 pounds of this stuff mm -hmm. on your premises, they had 54,000 pounds. In other words, 130 times the legal requirement, they did not inform the Department of Homeland Security. The Environmental Protection Agency was supposed to be informed of the liquid ammonia, and apparently they were so informed. It's weird enough that we have two different agencies of government. One regulates the explosive liquid, and one regulates the explosive solid. But more importantly, they didn't have an exit plan that's also required under the law. In other words, you have to have safety procedures. If mm -hmm. there's a fire, you have to have a strategy You know, to, I don't know, to, there were no sprinklers in this place, which seems extraordinary, given that a fire can set off an explosion. We have sprinklers in buildings, in, you know, in, in buildings that are not near as combustible to save a few desks. They don't have speakers in a place that could blow up and then harm a nursing home and a school. So it seems to me that, I don't know if it was the storage per se, but definitely failure to follow these regulations, I think, may well have cost a number of lives. And there ought to be an investigation, and the and people who are responsible for that ought to be held accountable for it. I mean, there's just, uh, you know, there, there's not a, uh, there's not a justification uh, for failure to comply with the regulations that you just cited. Uh, they're all new to me right now. Uh, and any other regulations that uh, are violated upon the, uh, uh, discovered upon the investigation, uh, it, it's, it, it's a no excuse situation. I mean, there's, there's nobody who has the right to defend uh, that kind of uh, activity. Here's the thing, there, there is a hodgepodge of regulations here. So there's federal, state, and local regulations. Apparently there's a local regulation that says uh, you can't store this stuff within 3,000 feet, about half a mile from a school. Mm -hmm. And yet they got a local uh, uh, exception to the zoning laws. A variance. A variance, yes they did. But of, in this case an explosive variance, a very dangerous variance that allowed a school and a nursing home to be there. I guess uh, most young kids can run fast, People in nursing home have even more difficulty getting out of the way. It's, it's to me, it's, it's, it's unspeakable, that it, it, horror, that they would have a nursing home just close to this plant. And it strikes to me that, and I guess I see a larger point here. I see that whenever we liberals try to say regulation is necessary and you can't put a, a plant that houses a potential explosive next to a school or a nursing home or that you need to, to have an exit plans or sprinklers or, mm -hmm. to, or to notify the Department of Homeland Security, we always hear any time that, well, Republicans say, stop giving us all these regulations. Regulations harm our business. This to me is precisely the kind of regulations that are necessary if they've been followed would have saved lives. Well, you're exactly right, Mark. I mean, I'm not going 
going to argue with that. I don't think you'll find any uh, Republican who would argue that these specifically are the types of regulations that are not petty, that are not minuscule, that, that, that are not ridiculous. These are the ones that do create and enhance uh, worker and community safety, uh, and they ought to be followed. And that's really, I think, where we would find common ground is on those kinds of things. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it, because it, it seems to me that also sometimes regulations just need to be modernized. I mean, the Department of Homeland Security didn't exist uh, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we have, like I said, the EPA regulates the liquid solids. The, uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security regulates, excuse me, the liquid solids, the liquid explosives. The Department of Homeland Security regulates the explosive solids. We have uh, the Texas Seed and Fertilizer. They were actually in this plant April 5th, I believe, just a couple weeks before the explosion. But they only regulate the safety of the seeds. Uh, and we have uh, the, the Occupational uh, uh, Safety and Health Administration hadn't been there since 1986 when apparently they had a number of violations and levied a $30 fine, which is less than most parking tickets I get in D.C. Uh, it seems to me sometimes you need to reg to modernize regulations. Uh, you know, and, and, and uh, maybe maybe sort of we shouldn't be against that either. Ma no, no, no. I'm I'm not against modernizing uh, regulations, but maybe we need to uh, wonder why OSHA hasn't been there in almost 30 years. Well, they they don't have a lot of staff. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, what, the reason they gave, interestingly enough, and this is also part of the company's fault. Uh, the company was required to check a box to say whether their company posed a risk of fire or explosive hazard. They did not check that box, uh, obviously. Well, that's, that, that's, that, that's, that, that's the company's that, fault, that, that, and they should have. That, that's obviously, at a minimum, gross negligence and perhaps criminal negligence. It, we don't know, but absolutely. you know, the investigation will find out. But at least we agree that, that, that regulations are often necessary. Uh, I said that the same with the, with the BP oil spill. And I, sadly, I believe these kinds of accidents, I, I know the one with the, uh, uh, there was one, um, I believe a garment factory that uh, had a fire uh, of, of about a few months ago and the workers mm -hmm. couldn't get out. These kinds of regulations are often necessary to protect lives. And I actually think if you add up all the deaths from terrorism, at least since September 11th, and all the deaths from these kinds of industrial accidents, it wouldn't surprise me if the deaths from industrial accidents are, are more in America, and we need, to, we need to work on that. So hopefully this is something we can work across we, the aisle. We, we, we do agree that to the extent that you know, this kind of thing can be prevented by requiring compliance with health and safety uh, regulations. We're on the same team. Okay, well that's good to hear. I want to move on to the other attack that got uh, very little notice. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I want to talk about the ricin attack, because this was a clearly intentional, I would argue, terrorist attack. It was done by a white guy in Mississippi and not a white Muslim uh, naturalized citizen and a, a, a white Muslim immigrant, uh, and has gotten very, very little media attention. Uh, they, you know, it's, it's actually an interesting story. Apparently this guy Dusky was trying to frame this other guy. Uh, to me, it's, it's got some sexiness to it. But why is it that this story has gotten so much, so little attention, again, compared to the other? But if you have an idea about that, you want to call in, give your two cents, please do so. You can call toll-free 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275, or locally 571-749-116. Around the world, one out of every three women will be beaten or otherwise abused in their lifetime, often by a family member or loved one. A future free from violence. It's all she's ever wished for. Did you know you have the power to stop children from joining gangs? You can help a father find a job and home for his family. You can assist a woman who can't afford the medicine she needs to live in the home she can't live without. You can choose to make a difference in our community Support Volunteers of America, and you can help improve the lives of nearly 2 million Americans each year with programs and services that help individuals and families overcome their challenges to become as independent as possible. Support the programs that are working in our community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089.
For some folks, saving for the future is easy, but for you, it might take a little more effort. Saving for your future is your responsibility, and there's a lot to save for. I never thought of that. Like your child's education, perhaps uncovered medical expenses, or just to be sure you can live the way you want when you retire. The time is now to save for tomorrow. Save now or work forever. The choice is yours. Here again, the Inside Scoop, Virginia. The Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking about the spate of terrorist attacks last week, and also the, the attack that didn't get much attention, the one in West Texas, where a explosion at a fertilizer plant killed at least 15 people, uh, with at least 10 of them being people, really the most brave, honorable, courageous people of all, the first responders who went in to save lives, who then uh, died in an explosion because, uh, well, ammonium nitrate is highly explosive. Now, it, it, it strikes me, Mike, it's really amazing. One of them apparently was the mayor of the town, uh, who's a volunteer firefighter, and, and, and may he rest in peace. Uh, but it's striking to me that the people in the town didn't realize that this posed a danger. Apparently, this plant served farmers throughout Texas, and I would think most farmers know this stuff is explosive. Uh, after all, they work with it all the time. Uh, so uh, maybe they didn't know it was stored there or what, but we really have to get to the bottom of this to prevent the, and, and, and I hope you'll agree with me that Texas needs to change its law and let people know when this stuff is stored nearby. Uh, that you have a right to know if a plant is making something that can explode. I'm, I'm, I'm flummoxed that they would, uh, that they would build something. I, I don't know what came first, the plant, no, the or, plant, the, the plant first. or the school. The plant came first. Why was, the schools, then okay, why, why was, why, why did the town give a permit to either the nursing home or the school to locate that close? You know, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, some have speculated that because land was cheaper near the plant, and this, they, this, the, the town wanted to build the school on cheaper land, and since people don't want to live near a plant, they built the school near that place, uh, which is, uh, if true, would be a, a, a pretty damning, I think, reason. Uh, yeah, sure, but we'll put the kids and the old people near the dangerous spot. Yikes, that's, that's a really scary thing. If I, you know, you know one, once upon a time, I was sentenced to a term of officer on a local board of supervisors, and I would have voted against that site I'm permit. I'm glad to hear that, Mike. I'm glad to hear that. Let me, let me talk about another scary thing. So in Mississippi, apparently, uh, two men do not get along. Uh, that's, I guess, not surprising. Uh, but uh, uh, one of them had trouble with uh, a, a local judge, uh, and, um, and, and apparently there's child molester ch charges against him, and, and he fingered this other guy who's been in and out of jail a few times anyway. Uh, it all ended up with one of them, probably Mr. Dusky, at least that's what the FBI now believes. Of course, everyone's innocent until proven guilty. Uh, but uh, being taken into custody, who sent letters with ricin in it, uh, which is a deadly, deadly biological agent. Just a tiny bit uh, can kill you, and there's no known antidote, unlike anthrax, which actually was sent uh, to those of us working in Congress 10 years ago, uh, but there was an antidote to it. Uh, now, I happen to know that the letter sent to President Obama and the letter sent to Senator Roger Wicker of Mississippi uh, were very unlikely to harm them because, thankfully, since the anthrax attacks, we now uh, take all mail that goes to Capitol Hill or the president and it's check screened. it very carefully. But one of them was to a local magistrate. Frankly, I'm not sure how she avoided the... Maybe, maybe uh, she watched her mail because, luckily, the other letters were found first. But whatever the case, uh, this could have led to her death. And I don't think there's any doubt, at least there's no doubt in my mind, I consider this a terrorist attack. Do you agree? I believe so, yes. Okay, um, because it's an attack on political officials, uh, presumably for some political reason that this, it, this it's guy a It's a terrorist. I mean, the guy, the, the guy's, uh, it's a terrorist attack. Okay, we agree it's I don't need to go attack. any further. Um, and yet, it, it got very, very little. I mean, if you turn on CNN today, you can, it's 24-7 it's, it's, it's Sarnayev family. You can talk, you can see the mother, you can see the father, you can get the history of the brothers, you can, uh, and again, it's, it's all interesting stuff, but this minor feud, or be, that became a major feud between these two Mississippi white men uh, really got, I mean, I had to look for it. I really had to look hard to find out the details of it, and yet uh, I just wonder whether the allure of foreignness Ironically, given that one of the, 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 the surviving suspect actually is an American citizen. He's a naturalized American citizen who grew up here in, in uh, the state of Massachusetts. Uh, whether that allure 
leads to more sexy news story than a white guy from Mississippi. I don't think so, Mark, because you know we're talking about the failure of the mainstream media here to cover this. Yes. The, main, the mainstream media would have loved to have a story where a southern white cracker uh, is involved in something like this. It just it fits into what they're going for. Regrettably, why has there been no story well, then? Well, because it failed and failed terrorist attacks uh, just don't garner the kind of coverage. Okay, that well then let me add one do. more to you that uh, there's just some guy and and we don't even know who's done it yet, I don't think, who's going around, and I believe it's in Texas, killing prosecutors, right? Mm -hmm. Killing prosecutors and judges. That's a terrorist attack. It is ongoing. It involves public officials. And yet, outside of Texas, I don't think I've seen almost anything. And again, I barely know about this. It was, this has been going on for weeks, and they haven't caught the guy. It was very big in the beginning. Uh, I confess to have lost track of it. I, I think it's still I, ongoing. I, I believe. I, I, I thought I lost track of it because they caught the guy. If you're telling me they haven't, I, then uh, I don't believe they have. You know, it's it's a you know it's, maybe, maybe they have. If they, but, um, the, but but part of the point we don't know is because there's been very little media attention. Right. And I believe that there's been deaths here. So yes, again, so again, this guy. Now, admittedly, the Boston Marathon is a very public thing, and this is small town Texas, and there's a hell, heck of a lot more media types in in Boston, I suppose, than in small towns in Texas. Uh, I've been told that they did catch the guy. Okay. But again, we, we got we got very very little information on that. They caught the Boston bomber too. Uh, and of course, we're we getting a whole psychological background into him, all of which is interesting. And, and we're going to cover the Boston bomber in just a few minutes right here on this show. There's a lot of interesting stuff here. But um, why, if a guy's kill, going around killing federal prosecutors and judges, isn't that an interesting if, story? If there had, it is. It's a, it's a very interesting story. It deserved more coverage I, than I'm it got. I'm told he was a justice of the peace, actually. Uh, he, he so was that's, a, even, that's even more interesting. He, he was a justice of the peace. Right. Um, uh, it, when a judge starts know, killing people, you know, I mean, that's, killing, that's a John Grisham novel, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> right? I mean, I, this should be a big story. I, well, he wasn't quite a judge. In, in Texas, they have right. these, uh, you know, the, these less than judges. Sheriff. Uh, what, I, don't, I don't know what judge is. It doesn't quite is. rise to the level of a sheriff. Um, you know, you, you kill three people one at a time, or actually a husband and wife, two, and then one. Uh, it just, you know, it, it was it was crowded off by bigger stories. I agree. It, it happened was even before I, Boston. I, I, no, I agree. It was underreported. I agree that we needed to know more about it. I, you know, the, the guy was uh, a whack job, and and uh, you know, he Let deserves to be tried and convicted if he's if, if the evidence is there. Uh, but but it got it, it was undercovered, but it was crowded off. But yeah, but but if, it did and it occurred before Boston Marathon bombing. My, I guess my larger point point is this. I think that when an attack occurs in a very public place, like the Boston Marathon, again, you could talk about the, the hundreds that were injured, but of course there were hundreds injured in West Texas. Uh, and I happen to think there's something juicy or interesting or more frightening about a Muslim domestic terrorist than a non-Muslim white guy from the South who's also a domestic terrorist. Actually, um, you and I have a different perspective on that. I am much more fearful of the, the lone wolf white guy uh, that's well, going to be almost impossible you should be. to it's track, right. impossible that's right. to predict. That's right. uh, I think that's a much more serious threat than, uh, well, in, in They're terms both of the serious number. threats, but 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 it's 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 likely with with excellent uh, intelligence work and excellent police work, uh, we should be able to stop the majority of the ones coming from overseas. The the lone uh, wolf white guy domestically is the one that we have almost no chance of stopping. So it scares me more. And what's interesting is that I think uh, that the Sarnaya brothers, for most of I don't know if you can, you can quantify it, 90% or whatever. But for most, in, not all intents and purposes, but for most intents and purposes, this is a domestic terrorist job. These two guys were raised in the United States. Uh, certainly the younger brother uh, was, by all accounts, uh, he, was a, he was a decent student. He was a nice guy. He was in the Big Brothers programs. He had lots of friends. None of his friends thought he could be involved in this. He had absolutely no ties to anything. He had only ties to his older brother. His older brother did spend six months in Dagestan, where we believe he was radicalized. We'll find out more information now. But uh, one of the reasons it's interesting, you point out that we can often stop these attacks from abroad. Uh, first of all, that's terrific, and I'm glad we can do that. It, so therefore, I guess it shouldn't surprise well, because, me. No, because we know where to focus the right. intelligence and right. where to focus and the that's terrific. enforcement. But my point is, is that maybe the reason why these young men succeeded, where Al-Qaeda has, thank God, failed since September 11th, is because they were basically Americans 
killing other Americans, and it's a lot easier to do that than for foreign terrorists to come in. I, you know, I don't know that I agree with you, Mark. I think I think they succeeded because we blew it. Um, you know, the intelligence was there. The Soviets gave us the tip. Uh, we call we, them Russians. We, now. we, we, the Russians, good point. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Living in the past. Uh, the Russians gave us the tip, and we did a cursory uh, investigation and dropped the whole thing. Well, uh, we blame the fact that there was a misspelled name in the computer. Uh, we, we have all these reasons. The, the fact is, we got two separate tips from the Russians on this. We should have been all two over tips? him. I, now I might say we got one tip, we checked it out, we asked for more information, and the Russians didn't get back to And us. then they got back to us independently with a second tip, and then we asked for more information, and they didn't respond to that one either. Okay. Two tips from the Russians. It's not, look, the Russians aren't going to give us more information because to do that reveals their intelligence sources. Well, they're also, not going to tell us the what Russians their intelligence sources are. The Russians are not entirely trustworthy. I mean, if this had been from the English, or the French, or the Israelis, uh, you know, the Italians, uh, well, maybe not the Italians, just because they might be negligent. Excuse me, that's horrible. I shouldn't say that. Uh, the Canadians, I should say. If this were a tip from a reliable ally, that'd be one thing. But Russia, of course, has fought a brutal campaign against Chechnya. Now, of course, there have been Chechen terrorists that have been brutal as well, including a, an attack on a school in Moscow. But uh, it would not be surprising if Russia did not give us the most credible tip in the world. I think you can concede that point. Yeah, I, I will concede that. But nonetheless, when they, when they give us two tips on the same guy, somebody that our computers did pick up that he left the country and went home to Russia, didn't pick him back up when, when he came back in. There was no follow-up interview. There was what no could nothing. we have done? Why would, what could we legally have I, done? I, I they interviewed the guy. He hadn't done anything wrong at that point. He may have had impure thoughts. He may have put something up on his YouTube page. Uh, but you have a right to express free speech, including you can even advocate overthrow the United States right. government as and, long as you don't take action and, to do and, it. And we have a right to surveil those people. And that's, what we should, that's where we blew it. We didn't surveil Well, we him. can survey him publicly. We would need a warrant or probable cause under the mm -hmm. Fourth Amendment to surveil him in the sense of reading his email or, or exactly or his email. I, I believe that I, I believe the information that was out there uh, that we had two separate tips uh, that he went to Russia for six months and nobody could account for his whereabouts or what he did that he was said uh, he went to visit that, his parents that, 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 that he, well that he was Chech, Chechen Muslim which is a, a hotbed uh, of terrorism and and violence. Yes, though he uh, went to Dagestan, not Chechnya, and and we, uh, you know, and the, his the, parents the, were living there. The, I mean, the, and he the, had the, a good excuse. The I, fact that we, we, why didn't we interview his family here? His uncle would, has been all over the uh, uh, the television talking I like about Uncle Russell. How, you know, I'm a big fan of Russell. How, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I just we blew it, Mark. I mean, the the it's, intelligence it's interesting if we had there. interviewed the uncle. That's actually a good point because the uncle seems to have known that his nephew was uh, taking up pursuits that he, he certainly did not approve of. And so maybe we should have interviewed the uncle. I, I guess uh, it's easy in hindsight to say, aha, this thread should have been studied when, of course, there's a tangle of, of hundreds of thousands of threads that may lead somewhere and most lead to dead ends. Uh, I hope we give our investigative agencies enough time and effort and manpower to look into all of these things. We'll find out exactly whether, whether anyone failed in this regard, and, and it should be fully investigated on that, on that I agree. Uh, when we come back, I want to talk about some of the legalities of, of the Boston bomber incident, uh, things like the Miranda warnings, and also some of the conduct of police. Now, they've been uniformly praised, and the people of, of Boston and Watertown definitely gave them applause as they left, and I don't doubt their individual bravery and courage going home to home looking for the terrorists. But were the decisions right? I'm going to talk about some of the police decisions, which in hindsight, I admit, I guess I, I question. We'll talk about it when we get back. If you want to call in, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. There's one just books at the library. There's more than just books at the library. Il n'y a plus que de livres à la bibliothèque. Hello. We have a lot of great books here today. You know there's more than just books at the library. I know. There's more than just books at the library. 
I don't want to be hooked to a machine. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing. Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their homes every day. The National Runaway Switchboard is here to help. 1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. In times of crisis, hope is just a phone call away. 1-800-RUNAWAY. Virginia. And so... Speaking of what happened in Boston, it's easy to explore the interesting questions of how the young men were radicalized. I'm sure we'll find out a lot more information about that. My concern is, as a lawyer and is an ex-legislative uh, attorney, uh, whether the policy was done right. It's easy to talk and complain about two terrorists. That, that's actually very easy to do. But I want to make sure that we do the right things when and if, and sadly, I, I probably should say when, the next terrorist attack occurs. So the police, again, I don't doubt their bravery. They worked very hard under very difficult conditions, and I, I in no way want to attack or impugn the individual officers who did their job. I want to ask about two decisions that were made. The first has gotten um, really very little media attention, and that is why people were asked to, quote, secure in place to begin with. Unquote. Uh, basically, people were told okay, the suspect was on the loose. They thought he was in Watertown, and they told everybody to stay home all day. You know, and they I, shut down the subway. They shut down everything. They, they shut, shut down, down the subway. They shut they down, shut down, down the entire they metropolitan down, area. Yeah, I mean, pretty much uh, most of uh, Boston, which is a metropolitan area of about a million people, was, was shut down uh, to catch this guy. Um, and uh, of course, the irony of the situation is the police went door to door. They didn't find him. They finally gave up at uh, 6 o'clock and said, all right, we can't find him. You can go out of your houses now. Guy goes out of his house for a smoke in Watertown, just outside the police perimeter, sees uh, his, the tarp on his boat uh, flapping, the, the tape, mm -hmm. looks inside, sees the most wanted man in America, immediately calls 911, and good for that, that man. But it strikes me that sometimes American citizens, uh, ordinary people, can do a better job than the police, and that's not an attack on the police, but there's simply more eyes and ears out there when you inform all of us. I mean, after all, why did the FBI put their names out, give us their pictures? I'm glad they did, because they knew that 300 million of us, one of us recognizes them, whereas not everyone in law enforcement ha had seen these guys. So um, I think in hindsight, uh, I can understand sheltering in place maybe at nighttime, having a curfew at night, because that's when, under the cover of darkness, a suspect could get away. But a curfew in the daytime that shuts down a major metropolitan city that in hindsight turns out to have been counterproductive, I just fear that future attacks will, will, will actually uh, take American cities down. I mean, if, if, if these attacks occur and suddenly New York is shut down for a day, I just wonder if that was the right decision. And, and of course, we have freedom of movement in America. Well, what's your view on it? Dead wrong decision. OK, uh, you agree with me. Yeah, I mean, look, they didn't, they didn't know it at the time. Everybody was scared. We didn't know what we were facing. Uh, so it was the wrong decision made under very difficult circumstances. Uh, the terrorists want two things. They want us to change our, uh, our, our lifestyle, our living pattern. Uh, closing down an entire metropolitan there area for a day is exactly, to the, wrong way to, exactly the wrong way to go about this. Uh, if they really felt the need to do that, uh, they could have uh, just shut down Watertown. You know, why did you shut down the entire uh, metropolitan area? They thought they had him uh, boxed in. Uh, they thought they knew where he was. They knew he wasn't in Roxbury or in Southie or something like that. Although, you know? honestly, if he so, got into a car, he could have been anywhere in the United right. States. By, or so the so, so, so it was the wrong decision, but uh, I'm not going to second guess them. I hope that we don't make uh, that mistake in the future. That's my main goal, just, that, just we, really, that, that we not make that mistake in yeah. the future. And also, it, it, in in some sense, it terrorizes people even more. You're kept in your own home. You're living right. in fear. You, you got to get out and live your life and show them that they're not going to change right. us. Which is why, for example, we would never shut down the Boston Marathon. It's got to run. It's got to have more people in next year. 
even though we can't put police along 26 miles. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, sometimes individual, I mean, when I think of individual Americans, it was individual Americans who stopped uh, Flight 93 from hitting the Capitol. It was individual Americans who stopped the shoe bomber, uh, wrestled him to the ground uh, on the plane. It was uh, individual Americans who stopped the underwear bomber. So uh, the answer is all of us are a lot more powerful collectively maybe then the authorities give us credit for, uh, maybe the authorities need to enlist the help of the public more and, and, and shut down our freedoms a little bit less. So we agree on that. Yeah, We've agreed a lot today. <laughs> Let me ask you about something else. We'll find some. Um, it shocked me to find out, because I watched every minute of it, because it was interesting news, that they find him in the boat, the guy calls 911, the police run out to the boat, uh, there's a gun battle, we hear, uh, and then they, uh, before they sec can secure the area, then they secure the area and they send the robot to get the, the and, and, okay. Turns out that the gun battle was not a battle at all. It was a bunch of police shooting at a boat. Uh, the suspect, uh, Jokar Tsarnaev, at that point was completely unarmed. He had no guns, no explosives. Whatever he did, he left, he left the Mercedes, which had guns and explosives. He left the SUV behind, ran off on foot, hid in a boat. He was an unarmed suspect. To me, that's embarrassing, but even a little bit worse. Obviously, I have no love lost for uh, Jokar Tsarnaev, but the idea of police shooting at an unarmed suspect who uh, they didn't know didn't pose a threat to them, but uh, to me, the police should never shoot first. They should always shoot second. Uh, and uh, they weren't even being shot at. So uh, this, this to me is something that really needs to be explored in police procedures. It should never happen, the police shoot first. Well, I don't know what, for lack of a better word, triggered uh, the first uh, bullet downrange on this. I think one jumpy police officer um, shot and then all the others heard the bullets. That, 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 that'll happen. When, when you're in a situation like that where you've got somebody cornered and the first shot rings out, they all ring out. Right, so, so I'm not blaming shots two through a thousand, but number one, number one uh, I mean, that guy should lose his job. I mean, I know it's a touchy situation. If, if they know who it is, you know. If they, if they, mean, can, well, yeah, yeah. If they can figure it out. But this is a really dangerous thing where, uh, I mean, uh, who knows what would have happened. The other thing is, even if he was armed, and they shoot all, they, they shoot, he may actually shoot back in self-defense, reasonably so. Yeah, I'll tell you what, the, the, the major objective at that point was to take him alive. Exactly, and need so, his intelligence. And so pumping 183 bullets into the boat, uh, or whatever the magic number was, was contrary to our objective at that particular time. Right, you can actually hear on the police radio at least some smart sergeant saying, hold your fire, mm -hmm. and, and eventually they did. But obviously, the point was we did want him to give information. And uh, one of the best ways to get information is to interrogate the guy. Of course, there is this thing called the Constitution of the United States, which says very clearly in the Fifth Amendment that you have the right to remain silent. Uh, and uh, most Americans agree that the Miranda decision, which says that you uh, should be told of this right, is proper constitutional law. I agree as well. But in this case, something very interesting happened. The police declared the public safety exception to Miranda. Now, the public safety exception to Miranda is uh, one of those watering downs of Miranda that tends to come from the conservative part of the court. And it says that if public safety is in question, you can interrogate someone, not use Miranda, but still use it against them in a court of law. To me, the public safety exception clearly violates the Fifth Amendment. The right answer here is not to declare some public safety exemption. The right example here is don't Miranda the guy, Question him all you want, just don't use any of the information he says against him in court. We've got witnesses, we've got videotape. We don't need anything he says ever to be used against him in a court of law. I'm quite convinced we have more than enough to convict this guy and put him away for life, uh, at least. Uh, so just don't give him his Miranda rights, but this whole public safety exception, here's what happened. With the public safety exception, he actually was smart not to talk, and I'm sure he was warned that, by the public defender that was that was uh, assigned to him. And rather than say, well, we shouldn't assign public defenders and so forth, why get, to me, get rid of the public safety exception, it actually leads to public not being safe. Well, Mark, I'm not a lawyer, although I do play one on TV occasionally. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is there is enough evidence out there, as you point out, that I could convict this guy. Anyone okay? could, right. So, uh, so I'm with you on this particular thing. It's scary. I thought that we we're going to find our first real argument tonight. 
he should not have been Mirandized. He should have been interrogated at length. I don't know. But none of it should be used uh, against him in court. Right, right. We, we don't need it in court. No, uh, exactly. We, we but need that's to the problem with this exception. We need to extract the intelligence. We need to find out everything that he knew. I don't think everything he told us was the truth. Oh, I, I, think don't, that, I, don't, you know, I don't think that. But I'll tell you something else that could have been done. So apparently he wasn't given Miranda by the police. He was given Miranda by this magistrate judge. Who People was, have, who, was well, who and where did he come from and who sent him? Well, she, by the way, All right. uh, was the ordinary magistrate judge in charge. What happened is this. The prosecutors filed a sealed complaint. According to federal rules of criminal procedure in federal court, the magistrate is required to act without delay, usually according to the rules. That's one day and come and the procedure is to tell them his rights. Now, as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't the magistrate who dropped the ball, but it was the prosecutors or the FBI who dropped the ball. If they wanted to file a special motion with this, with this judge, they should have. But I'll tell you something else they could have done that I think would have been far better. Everyone has a right to an attorney. I want to keep that right. I respect the Constitution. They could have gone to the public defender and said, you know what? Screw the public safety exception. We will make a deal with you. If you will allow your client to talk freely and allow us to interrogate freely, we promise that we will not use anything he says against him in court. We'll sign right here. Nothing he says will be used against him in court. We'll prove it all using stuff he did before. And you can even make a better deal, as they often do is with plea bargains, and they say, if he gives us stuff that's useful and captures other terrorists, we'll uh, commute his sentence to, to life imprisonment rather than the death penalty. Something like that, which would be fine with me, would that would actually encourage him to speak rather than encourage him to shut up. Mark, great idea. Ain't gonna happen. If I'm the public defender, I'm not taking that deal. Sure you First would. of all, I don't to, to save I, your client's I, life. I don't have the authority on behalf of my client to do that. You'd have to talk to them. I, I have to talk to them, right. and I'm gonna tell my client not to say anything at that particular point in time. We're not cutting any deals in the first ten minutes. You know, th th these are deals you cut days and weeks down the road. It's not okay. something. You well, well, maybe, maybe he maybe he will talk days and weeks down the road, and maybe we can still. I hope they do cut this deal because uh, I think we have valuable information to learn from this guy. Uh, to me. Uh, Notwithstanding what he did, he doesn't seem to have been as bad as his brother. Uh, he seems to have someone who followed along. I want him in jail for life, but I think if we can get useful information to put away other bad guys, I'd be fine to commuting the death penalty in this particular case. I would too, but I don't think he's the one that's going to have that information. I think it's his dead brother who has that information. So uh, well, he may have been told stuff. We'll have to, we'll have to find so out. So unless he unless he coughs up really really useful it information, it's the death penalty All for right. him. All right, fair enough. Uh, let me ask you about this, and we've got a, about a minute. Uh, left uh, in this segment. We're going to go on to the next segment. Um, the, the British, the French, and the Israelis have all found evidence that while they won't concede it's 100% certain, they say it's virtually certain that the Assad regime has used chemical weapons. Uh, President Obama said that was his red line. Uh, that if, if he used red line, if, he, if Assad crossed the red line, Assad's already murdered 70,000 plus Syrian, innocent Syrian people. But this was the red line. This was supposed to be the game changer for President Obama. Um, I hope the president keeps to his word. I'm a little concerned that he, he wants his 100% proof. And uh, the idea that the United Nations was going to look this up is laughable, <laughs> given the Russian veto. I'm glad I don't so, need to say that. No, you don't. I think we, we've agreed a lot tonight. Uh, but uh, he, needs to be, he needs to hold Assad's feet to the fire. Frankly, to me, it, we, I would have had no fly zone before the use of chemical weapons. No mm -hmm. question about it. When the President of the United States sets a red line, he's got to obey that red line, lest other people like Kim Jong-un comes to mind, realize that our red lines are meaningless. The credibility is on the line, exactly. And uh, if we allow our credibility to be impugned here, uh, over uh, the long run um, than not only Kim Jong-un, uh, but the uh, idiot mullahs in uh, Iran as there well. You, you know, what uh, red line is they're not going to get nuclear weapons? Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, no, we need to take action. Though interesting, there are people for and against action in both parties. This isn't a partisan issue. Uh, the toll-free number, 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. If you want to call in, we'd like to hear from you. We'll be right back right after this. I helped turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours, six days a week, year round. With loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged. 
where teachers have more time to teach. And students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your Social Security Statement of Your Benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much Social Security you're eligible to receive and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement, because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. So, who has the drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you with drug free Here again, the inside scoop for Virginia. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Uh, I, of course, uh, am a Democrat. Uh, my guest, Mike Lane, is Republican, and we've agreed uh, far too often tonight uh, than we usually do, but it's good. Reasonable people can agree, and it shows that people across the party aisles can agree. Um, it seems that in Congress they have a much more difficult time agreeing. Although Democrats and Republicans did come together under a new law that they just uh, signed. Uh, apparently, uh, President Obama can't sign it. I don't know if you heard this. This is the latest, because the bill to allow the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, to, um, to bring back the air traffic controllers that they furloughed under the sequester, apparently uh, it was written so quickly, parts of it were handwritten, that the bills are not identical. And one of those things the Constitution requires is the bills to be identical, and apparently there's a plural, an S, in one draft of this bill and not in another draft. The one passed by the House does not equal the one passed by the Senate, so now it's going to have to go back. They're going to have to fix it. But in any case, <laughs> it, will, it will be done. But the reason why Congress acted so quickly... I, I want to know, I'm sorry, who discovered this stray S in one bill that was not in the, oh, the other clerk. one? I guarantee it was the clerk. They go through... Okay, they, 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 no, they, I'm sure they, they put it through a computer program probably today. In the old okay. days, they would, you know... <laughs> uh, but no, they do that uh, to make sure, and you, you have to pass identical bills. Okay. That, that's, that's the Constitution. I understand that. Um, but, but Congress acted really quickly. So here's what happened here. Uh, and, and we'll go with the facts, and then you can tell me where you disagree. So we have this sequester, uh, this, this thing that um, uh, both Republicans and Democrats say they didn't want, uh, though uh, I, I, I think uh, more Democrats voted not to have it than your, I think your party voted more for the sequester than my party, but we, we can let that Less lie intense now. opposition, how's let, that? Th there you go. Uh, but when it came to the FAA, they don't have that much flexibility because it's required to be across the board cuts and the Federal Aviation Administration uh, air traffic controller budget pretty much goes to their salaries. Doesn't really go anywhere else. Uh, you know, the other things it goes to is things like the facilities there. Um, and so they had to furlough the people. In fact, uh, uh, I saw a fact checker in the Washington Post, people who said they didn't have to furlough the people got, got free Pinocchios because they really did under the law. The new bill uh, acts quickly because a lot of American air traffic passengers were upset by having to wait in line, and they wrote their member of Congress angrily. And this bill takes it out of airport improvement. We have to end airport improvement in this country to put these people back on the job. So okay, air traffic controllers are very important. I agree, they need to be on the job. But I think airport improvement is important too. I think we need more runways. I think we need, uh, that's a good thing too. To me, it just shows the foolishness of this whole sequester idea. Uh, because now the stuff that gets a lot of public attention gets the money, but there's still kids being denied Head Start. There's still money going away from Medicaid. There's still all the, the cuts in this program. We need to end the sequester. Absolutely not. We found our topic for the night. Okay. Uh, no, the, the sequester uh, has turned out to be, for the most part, much ado about nothing. It really has not had the impact that uh, that, that the president 
uh, screamed and yelled for about two weeks on the campaign trail that it was going to have. Uh, I, don't, I don't think, you know, I, I mean, it's not useful to argue as to whether or not the FAA had the legal authority to shift funds within um, because the problem has been resolved. Now, we'll, we'll re-resolve it with the errant S uh, taken out or added or something like that. That'll take a few days, um, but it'll happen. But the, uh, uh, the simple fact of the matter is that uh, airport improvement uh, is something that we can wait a year for. Uh, it's but, not a big but deal. To me, there's a larger issue here. We have severe infrastructure problems in this country. It, airports, it's also more fundamental things like bridges. And mm -hmm. you know, maybe when the next bridge collapses and unfortunately a number of people die, suddenly people will say, well, wait a minute, why didn't Congress put this in? We have structural reports that come out monthly talking about how we are more deficient now than we've been in decades, uh, that our bridges literally are falling apart and that we just don't have enough money to, and then we have roads. And infrastructure is one of those basic things that everyone relies on that allows an economy to grow. But businesses support infrastructure. Uh, Republicans and Democrats support infrastructure, but we're, ro we're robbing ourselves uh, to, to pay for our ordinary expenses. Well, you know, the president, five years ago, four years ago, got $800 billion in stimulus money. Uh, why didn't we some of that? it? Some of it went to infrastructure. But, but how much a of lot it, of it did not. How much of it went to Solyndra? Well, and how very, much of it went to... Less than 1%. And, and, and how much of it went to uh, uh, Fisker Motors? I'd say what, one third went, you know? to, went to tax cuts. So your party loves tax cuts. So why don't we... So uh, if, instead of going to so, infrastructure... So, so why, don't, why didn't we take the money that went to Solyndra and put that into a bridge that maybe needed to... You know, $500 million would pretty much rebuild any bridge in the country. Mm, um, you've never seen so the big dig. That's a tunnel, Boston. not a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the Wilson Bridge uh, next to my house in Alexandria could have been done for five hundred million dollars. Yeah, I think it was one hundred and eighty-three million. Was, was it? Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know. I, I admit, once you get to those levels of dollars, <laughs> my, my eyes glaze over too. I know too. a couple hundred million here and there. It all adds up it, to real it, money. It all adds up. But but the point is is that uh, infrastructure should be something we all agree on. And one of the things President Obama has tried to do since the stimulus package is spend money only on infrastructure. The Republicans repeatedly shut him down. And this idea that in order to keep air traffic controllers on the job, which I agree is a good thing, that's why it was bipartisan support for this bill, we're now go not going to improve any airports in this country. I gotta tell you something. In France, in England, in Japan, they're way ahead of us. Their stuff is much more modern than us. They've got high-speed trains going from their inner from their city. To, we don't even have a train oh, oh. going from JFK Airport to, uh, to to Manhattan. I mean, it, that's shocking. In Europe, in London, in Paris, in Amsterdam, I, they all have trains going right to their airport. Um, we're, we're being left behind in the modern age, the richest country on earth, because I, cont I contend your party is penny wise and pound foolish. No, we, we would actually support that kind of spending uh, before some other kinds of spending that go on. But the fact is, Mark, we don't have the money now and we've got to find ways to- Sure we do. But we've got to find ways, you, you can't spend your way out of a, a, a spending crisis. You have to reduce spending. It's not a spending crisis. It's well, a revenue it crisis. Is. It's a revenue crisis. I've not heard that before. A revenue crisis, it's a revenue not, crisis. Not a spending crisis. Revenues are now 24% of GDP, whereas historically, Far less than they've been. historically they've been 18 to 19%, and we have a revenue crisis? No, because you're not taking, there's state and local governments that are much, have much less money because the federal government has to subsidize them. Well, uh, let's, let's stop paying, that, first of all. You know, in Bill Clinton's era, we had more than enough taxes to cover all of our needs and give us a massive surplus. And it was your party that insisted on and these tax cuts for the rich. And there are things that you and I have agreed Martin, on. You got your, you got your tax welfare. increase on the rich. That's over. It's off the table now. It's not off you the table. You got your tax increase That's for the rich. For people making more than $400,000. <laughs> we didn't end the hedge fund loophole. We didn't end the, the, uh, the jet, uh, jet plane business jet, private jet owners loophole. And you just we want, to put, you want to put all these jet uh, manufacturing mechanics out of, out of work and have them I receive food stamps them, and on the unemployment I line. I want That's rich what you want to do. people with private jets skilled, to pay. Skilled union machinists, and I, you want I to put want them out of jobs. rich people with private jets to pay the same taxes that people who don't have private jets pay. I want the same standard and the hedge fund loophole. You've agreed with me to cut agriculture, agribusness yeah. subsidies. Yeah. Uh, we, and we, we could, we, there's between a you lot, and I, there's between a you lot and I, we of could, corporate welfare We could, we could probably sir, solve about 20% of the problem between us. So that we, we didn't more than enough that to, And you know what? That'd be more than enough to cut the sequester right there. We wouldn't even have to touch entitlements. Well, the sequester's been a good thing though. It's not it's, been a good thing. Ask, all those, ask all those people in airports if it's been a good thing. 
Um, According to uh, the poll released by Rasmussen today, only 16% of the American people even know somebody who was inconvenienced in an airport last week. It's because it only happened for a week. If it happened for a few months, I guarantee you, everyone would know about it. I'm not talking about they themselves being inconvenienced. Only 16% know someone who was inconvenienced in the airport. 16% of Americans know people who traveled last week. But give it a month. Give it three months, and this would have been a real problem. And that, that's the issue. A lot of these things right. are over time. The, the FAA, one other thing in there, the, the, the by F- the way. The was, FAA has more money, even with the sequester, the FAA has more money than it did last year. So, you know, I, I think that we can, uh, you know. No, oh, well, no, Obama, no, because no. There, there, there was. Obama in his budget, Obama, what, what budget from Obama? But there he, was a budget from Obama. He, he requested a significant increase in FAA funding for this year, and somehow, inexplicably, the Congress doubled down and gave him more than he asked for. So even with the sequester, they have more money to spend this year than they had last year. Well, there's a whole bunch of things that the FAA, well, the FAA writ large is not just air traffic controllers. It's things like air, airplane inspections, which are right. important. We talked about, you got to regulate these things, make sure the maintenance is done. You don't mm-hmm. want an airplane blowing up. Uh, you know, there's airport or even just falling apart. Or even just falling apart. Uh, the point is, is that these are all pretty necessary government functions. And I think uh, many conservatives have this idea that government is just wasting money. You know, that may be true of some parts of the Pentagon. It's certainly true about subsidies to, to agribusinesses and things like like that. But most of the time, the government, the FAA, audit the books. If you find waste, cut out the waste. But don't this kind of arbitrary cut out okay. 8% Again, I think, makes no I th- sense. I, th- I, th- I think the airport improvement can wait for a year. It, it's just not going to kill anybody. You know what? We need airport improvement like we need everything else. I'll tell you one thing we don't need, though, uh, and this is one of the things that got in the bill. There are a number of rural airports that have things like one or two planes a day. There was a story mm-hmm. on one of them in the Washington Post, I believe it was in Texas, or maybe it was Nebraska, I don't, it was in the planes, uh, where uh, there were more birds on the runway than planes uh, because some congressman wants his district to have an airport, uh, even though it's barely used. That's where they were going to cut first. That makes sense. It, 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 it basically frustrates very few people, unlike delays at John F. Kennedy in, or, or in, National in, in, Airport. In the fixed bill, there were uh, numerous examples of pork. I, I'm, I'm not remembering no, you're them right. all now. You're right. I was outraged. Me I too. Would, if, if anyone on either side uh, would sponsor an amendment when this goes through again to strip out 100 percent of the pork that. projects. I'll support that. And then let's get the. I'll support air, that. Air that's that's, that's, that's you and I together. We, we, we should be able to do this. Uh, unfortunately, Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell don't listen to us. Right. Um, last thing. Uh, Jason Collins became the first professional athlete that's currently an athlete in any one of the major sports in America, football, baseball, basketball, to come out as gay. Uh, he is. Uh, I think not uh, what a lot of people think of when they think of, of gay people. He's a seven foot tall uh, center. Uh, he's he's African American, and he's a very brave young man, or 34 year old, I guess, uh, middle aged basketball years man. Uh, but uh, to come out while he's still there. Now many pro athletes have come out after they've left the NFL, the NBA, and, and Major League Baseball. He's the first to do so. Let me suggest to you that. The, the second's going to come soon, and the third even sooner, and there'll be five and ten, and then no long, it'll soon no longer be a news issue at all. Good for Jason Collins for being the first. Mark, it's not a news issue today. What makes him so narcissistic as to think that I care what he does? He's the when first. He's not a, but that's who, the point. Who cares? Uh, it matters. Who cares? Oh, no, no, it this matters. This guy can do whatever he wants in his private no. life. It's totally and the completely a thousand ma- percent irrelevant. No, no, the reason why it matters is because people were afraid to say such things. People were afraid in Major League Sports. People were afraid to go into Major League Sports because of harassment. The fact that he was able to say so I means some other gay kid is going gonna, is gonna to feel more comfortable going into sports. It's going to end a lot of the prejudice that's going on in the locker room. It's a major step forward. I, but I agree with you. In two, three years, I have it'll, been, be, it'll be old news. I have been blind to any prejudice in the locker room, never heard about it. Oh, come on. No. Mark, I've never heard about it. I've never heard anybody say it's a problem. No, it you is. Know. It's a major problem, particularly uh, when, and, and when you have... I, I, I know. It's a major I mean, problem in professional sports, and it's a major problem in high schools and all across the country where you have the gay teens that are three times more likely to commit suicide than straight teens. We need to end this prejudice. Good for Jason Collins. But I, I agree with you on this. It may be news today. It shouldn't be news two, three, four years ago, and that is a good thing. Mr. Nar- Mr. Narcissism. No, oh no, it was a good thing. No. Good thing. Thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate it. If you want more information, go to MarkLevinTalk.com. Follow me on Twitter at MarkLevinTalk.